being a part of a legacy can be a double-edged sword. And for today's guest, Tom Ziegler, he does his legacy proud. The son of leadership icon, author, and speaker, Zig Ziegler, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Tom carries on the Ziegler philosophy of you can have everything you want if you just help enough people get what they want. Tom, my friend, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm excited about our time today. I, I am really excited. And you know, I so I've had a chance over the last few years to connect with several sons of several great leaders who have also themselves become great leaders, such as yourself. I talked to, to, uh, to Michael Tracy. I've talked to Jeffrey Gittimer. Um, I've talked to so many people within the space and being the son of Dave Sandler helps me kind of just understand it's, it's challenging sometimes to, you know, to fall in line with those footsteps. Have you, were you challenged at all early on in the process with that, or was this just easy for you? Uh, there was a couple of times. Uh, the first one was after dad died. And one of my friends, he asked me how I was doing. And I said, well, I'm doing, I'm doing good, but this legacy is pretty heavy. And he said, well, wait a second. Your dad's legacy is secure. The only one you've got to worry about is your own. <laughs> that, and, it's nerve, nerve wracking. Right. And so that really did, that put perspective in place because we can, you know, we can look at the blessings uh, that we have and the, and also the burdens, you know, this, expectation to, to do it the same way or you know and and he and my friend was just saying look you know your dad loved you for who you are you've got your own gifts and talents create your own legacy the second thing that was hard was I didn't really speak at all until about 10 or 12 years ago I, I didn't go out publicly I didn't train I didn't speak I didn't want to my job was to put the greatest speaker maybe ever in the history of the world on stage. And everybody said, you should go and speak. And so I started speaking and it was gut wrenching. I just, I didn't like it. Um, and I had to sit myself in the corner and go, why don't you like it? And even though I got good reviews, my, my answer to myself was because I thought people wanted me to be just like dad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and nobody can do that. And so I said, no, is that true? And I said, no, it's not true. What do they want? They want me to carry on the same philosophy. And so I'm kind of a nerd. I'm kind of a geek and, and my humor is real dry and I don't run around on stage like dad did. So when I went out just being myself, but carrying on the philosophy, the principles and values, that's different. That's when it really became fun. Yeah, I can, I completely relate to what you do, what you are saying. And, and man, oh man, fill in those shoes. I was always concerned. I was having to fill my dad's shoes, not just in the, in the world of, of training and speaking, but yeah, the, the same way. And, and I had to relax. I had to say, nobody's expecting you to be Dave Sandler. Nobody's expecting Tom Ziegler to be Zig Ziegler. And, and that's actually a good thing. That takes a lot of pressure off when you start to, when you start to realize that. Although we yeah. are here because one of the things that was becoming apparent uh, for Doug uh, in his life was the need to step into those shoes, right? See, so it sounds like Tom, you were so involved in the business that it was a natural way for you to just sort of say, okay, I am supposed to step into this now. I'm not him how do I do this? Uh, Doug's path had sort of veered off from the sales training perspective for a little while. And he had made his own name in another niche and was very successful in that um, and has great talents in so many ways. So for him, it was almost like when we first started working together, success was trying to find him and he was running from it in the sales <laughs> way in the customer service. And I said, this is a message. The universe is saying it's time for you to pick the gauntlet up and keep carrying it. And even though you don't want to do it in the same way, we can serve the, the audiences and the perspectives that you are passionate about, AKA podcasters. So for you, Tom, what was that, that time frame like when at first, like how long did it take you to say, all right, I know that they want my dad and I'm, I don't want to do this. I don't like to do this. And then what was the process or what changed for you besides the thought and the realization that it was just about the message? What was your own growth path in that time to take it on and to realize you just had to be you and, and to sort of massage into that? Yeah. So out of college, uh, my goal was to be a PGA uh, golfer on tour. I played college golf and I was traveling and playing tournaments around the country. And I got a job at the company to, to basically support my golf habit. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm working in the warehouse uh, doing, uh, then I moved from shipping to audio 
and video uh, duplication, you know, just, just kind of that very basic stuff. And I realized golf wasn't going to be the future. And I moved into sales and I fell in love with sales from the, cause just like you, Doug, I was raised uh, selling is just like, it's in the DNA, you know, it's, you yeah. just don't even know you're doing it when you do it. And I just, I just fell in love with it. Um, but never, never wanted to speak, you know, never wanted to be that, that front person, uh, moved up through, through management. And then I was in an event one day and this, and this is a huge event. So there's like 30,000 people and it's an Amway event. And dad was the surprise guest speaker. So what that means is there's 30,000 people. They know that somebody's coming who is going to be special, but they don't know who. And so we had 20 tables of products. So these are all audio, cassette tapes, VHS tapes, and books. And at the break, they emptied out this whole basketball arena. They emptied the whole thing out. So at five o'clock, we run in, we set up all these product tables. We put uh, all the tablecloths on top of it so that nobody could know. They opened the doors at seven. The first guy through the door looks over and one of the tablecloths was open <laughs> and he saw dad's picture. And he turns and looks at me and he goes, is Zig Ziglar going to be here? And I'm like, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so he comes over to me and I, I put the tablecloth down and he goes, is he going to sign autographs? And I go, yeah. He goes, well, where, where is that going to be? And I go, well, it's around there. He goes, is that where the line is? And I go, well, yeah, but there's, you know, nobody even knows he's coming. He goes, I'm going to go stand in line now. <laughs> so it's seven o'clock. He's supposed to go on at midnight. It's Amway. It's going to be after one in the morning because they always run behind. He goes and stands in line that doesn't exist. And so two hours later, I go over to him and I go, what's your story? And he'd come from Central America and to make a better life. And when he comes in, he moves to Chicago, he moves in with his brother. And after three weeks, he tells his brother, if I'm going to be successful, I need to learn English. And his brother gave him a copy of the book, See You at the Top, and said, look, translate this from English to Spanish and then from Spanish back to English. Not only will you learn English, but it will change your life. This guy starts crying right there in front of me because he was an alcoholic. He was about to get divorced. His wife was going to leave him. And what he learned in that book changed his life. Wow. And that's when the sh that was the first big shift in my career is I knew that we weren't in the book and tape business. We were in the life changing business. And so that was huge. And you got to know that we've had, you know, I've got, I've got, hundreds of stories like that. And it's not just about a family put back together or marriage saved. It could be about an entrepreneur whose business, you know, they took the sales principles and it went to the top or, you know, just all these different things that happened. That's when I fell in, that's when I fell in love with it. So that was the, that was the first one. Uh, then I moved into leadership and management, it became the president all those years ago. And dad used to tell me and my sisters, he would say, uh, you'll never know freedom until I'm gone. And I didn't know what that meant. And what he was really saying, I figured it out, is that we were there supporting him. But when, when he was gone, then we could use the gifts and talents that God gave us in a different way for our, because we can't do it the way he did it. It's impossible. There's no way. And so we had to reinvent the company. And that, that's what we've done. Uh, I love working with leaders and leadership and, and, you know, understanding what makes people think from a mind, uh, a mindset perspective, the training, the skills, all that's important. But my love of the business came back to that guy at that arena 30, 30, over 30 years ago or 25 years ago, I'd say. You know, I, I don't know if you can see behind me, I've, I've got plenty of shows. I've got a lot of podcasts. And so what you just said about uh, the freedom of when he's gone, not in direct relation, but it wasn't until I launched my spirit purpose and energy show and have countless stories, just like you, of people who've been to my events, who people who have uh, written in just because they've listened to the show and their lives have shifted and changed. And prior to us launching sales training for podcasters, I was that, oh, I used to be an actress and a singer, dancer, healer, personal trainer. I I've, I'm that service provider that wasn't, so I was always been a speaker. I've always been on, in, on the camera and on the stage, but 
never really selling anything. And I love what you said earlier on about like your dad and Doug's dad and selling is like in your blood. Like you just love that. And for so many people, the sales conversation isn't one of authenticity and isn't mm-hmm. one of deep meaning. And I only became a good salesperson because I saw that what the work I was doing was changing lives of people I had never met, just like that guy with your dad's book. When you can do something and put something out into the world that you're passionate about, regardless of who you are or who came before you, just the fact that you are wanting to help people and you want to serve them and you want to help them break out of whatever pattern they're in, there becomes this shift in the selling process, at least there was for me, that now it's not about, it's never been about the money. Of course, we all have to pay our bills. And maybe in the beginning, I wanted to sell more things so I could feel freer, I thought, or whatever. But it, there was a shift somewhere for me where the minute the the fan mail kept coming in more regularly, when the, you know, when the life-changing stories come in, that now this is not about my, this is not about the dollar. It's not about a hundred dollars, not about a thousand dollars, not about $10,000. This is about a life that I, I have the privilege to be able to affect. And so now selling is not about selling. It's about changing lives. So I love that you just said that because I think that's one of the the things we try to promote on this show and for podcasters in general, anyone who's listening that may or may not be a salesperson, the idea of sales, regardless of what your money relationship is, when you can remember, no matter what it is you do, you're an artist, you're a singer, you're an entertainer, you're an educator, whatever you do, it has value in possibly changing someone's life. And when you can be in touch with that, the sales process becomes easy, even if you're not that good at it, because your intention is pure and you and you care. So I love that that was such a, a profound story for you that really, again, sort of anchored in that mission of your dad and his company and the, and the information and the books and the leadership. So from there, I mean, what, what was the next level for you in terms of getting to, so that was like, okay, that's the start and I'm, I'm getting into it, but I want to know that moment for you on stage when it changed, when you became the, the, uh, in the, the head leader face salesperson, uh, I'm not my dad, but I am, you know, but I am that force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Just to, you know, let me, let me uh, hit a sales point really quick because uh, you were talking so strong about sales. Uh, what, being the nerd that I am, I'd love to, to know the why behind the why. And so one of my, uh, I don't know if it's a hobby or one of the things that I enjoy doing is I like to study Hebrew. And, and do, you, do you guys speak Hebrew by any chance? Very, you very, should. No, very, very, <laughs> very little. I had my bar mitzvah. That's about as, as, as far as the Hebrew. Now, I know a little bit. And I, and I get your emails, by the way, Tom. And I, and I, and I do love, I love the connection that you, that you make with your audience through either scripture or through just, you know, spiritual advice. And I, I love that. So go ahead. Go ahead about talk about Hebrew. Yeah. So I, I learned this from Rabbi Daniel Lappin. So I don't know if you've ever interviewed. He's be, he'd be great to get on. Uh, he's just amazing. He wrote that shall prosper. But in, in Hebrew, there's a couple of words for the word sell. And have you heard this before? No, I'm, I'm listening okay. now. Yeah. So, and as you know, if you study the language, uh, of course, it's God's language, uh, in my opinion. And every word, every letter has a numerical value and a moral value. And some words have more moral standing than others do. And so one word for sell is just a transaction. It just, it's, it's just kind of an everyday common word, but the word, I, and I don't know the Hebrew word for it, but the, but, uh, cause I can't say it or pronounce it, but, but there's a word that, that means sell. And what it really means is to look into the future of someone, anticipate a problem they might have, and then help them avoid it. Now I can't think of a higher moral calling than selling. And so if you're listening, if you solve a problem, if you have a product or a service that solves a problem, you have a moral obligation Amen. to sell. I believe that. And you've got to use every skill, everything that you have. And then, so that reminds me of my very first sale at the company. So we're talking about selling it was phone sales. I go through a week of training and I'm scared to death. And I go in to my cube 30 years ago and the phone rings and I pick it up and there's this man, he was ancient. He was probably like 60 years old you know? <laughs> I mean, cause I'm a kid. And he tells me the story and he says, Hey, 
my my daughter and son-in-law are going through a really tough time in their marriage. Uh, he's a dentist. He just brought a practice. He still has debt from dental school. They have three kids under five. What is it that you think, because I love your dad, what is it, what program do you think I could get them that would help them? And so I did the catalog on it. You know, you can always tell uh, baby brand new salespeople because they just start throwing out the catalog. Luckily, he cut me off. He cut me off after 10 seconds. And this is what he said, Tom, here's my American Express card. Send them whatever you think they need. Is it okay if we pray? And so my very first sale had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the integrity and the reputation of dad and our company. And so if you focus on your own integrity and reputation, always keep that pristine, always do the right thing. And you have the moral conviction to lean into selling so much that you can solve someone's problem before they even know they have it. That's when you're hitting on all cylinders. I love that. What what great what great advice. I I think the challenge from a from a a new entrepreneur or a new salesperson's perspective or somebody that's new within the practice of selling, I think that they get so caught up in the I've got to close a sale that they forget that they're on the other side of it they're actually solving a problem for someone. So I love the connection between problem solving and actually you know, the obligation of, Hey, look, if you have a gift and you can provide that gift to somebody, you're all, you're obligated to be able to share it with them. And it, it's up to them whether they want to buy it or not. They're not buying because of you. They're buying because of their own, their own problems. Yeah. How do you get somebody to get out of their own way though? Cause I think that a lot of times that's the biggest challenge they have is that they just, they keep puking product. They forget to stop and listen. Yeah. So it's the same thing that happened. This was the other turning point, uh, JJ, in, in my speaking. Uh, it's the same in sales. It's when you realize that you're not there for you, you're there for them. Mm -hmm. So once I realized that I just needed to represent the principles and values, my focus switched from what about me to what about them. And so suddenly I was speaking and the only people in the room mattered were, were everybody else. It was no longer the self-conscious, am I going to come off right? You know, will they laugh? Whatever. And that was really dad's superpower on stage is when he went on stage, he only had two things in his head. One, did I prepare enough with the amount of time I had? And number two, did I speak God's truth and love? And here's the thing, when you, when you speak in truth and love, it, it doesn't really matter how people receive it. That's between them and God. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Right. If you love them and you care about them and you're speaking the truth, they can say yes or no. That's between them and the creator. That's that's not a rejection of you. That's a that's, you know, them dealing with something on their own. And of course, when you have sales skills and you've studied it, and you understand, you know, the blocks that people have and why they might hesitate, then you can be you can get better at that. But really, it takes the pressure off when you're focused on them and their needs. Well, I, I love the idea because I think that one of the things that challenges most people is that when they feel like they have someone that is interested, they feel the need, the necessity to actually tell them everything they know about why they should be using the stuff that they have. And the beauty of podcasting is this, and that we have found and we over the last, you know, six years of in 1200 of my own episodes of my own show, and JJ's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes, totally connected audiences that she can share this amazing message with her community, and they will tell her what they want. The beauty of podcasting is that if you grow your community long enough, and for those of you that are in our community and listening to this, know that if you're brand new at podcasting, this is not about you pitching products and using your podcast as a platform. It's about building a no like, and trust factor long enough with somebody that's listening in your audience that they will know when the timing is right for them to connect with you. And that could potentially be buying your products and services. So it's just a timing thing. And I think that that's one of the keys of, um, sharing your message without sharing it from a sales perspective. Yep. You know, our, we've been doing our podcast for over 12 years. We were one of the early adopters and I call it our, our secret weapon. We'll, we'll have people call up and they'll say, Hey, I want to come to your program. And it's a big ticket. And I'm like, do you want to know about it? They're like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and I'm like, but you're not on our list. Who are you? Oh, I've been listening to the podcast for however long. And so when you constantly bring value and you let, know, you let people know how they can get involved, 
you're going to find over time your best customers come out of that situation. And I, and I love that because now you've got a relationship based on value and trust rather than a hope and a prayer, which is what a lot of people, uh, the sale, unfortunately, the sales process, it doesn't take the time that it should to build that relationship on trust. That's what podcasting really does for me. I mean, I'm a huge podcast fan is it builds relationships. It builds trust. Uh, I meet family everywhere I go because of our podcast. I have attracted my soul family also through my podcast. And I love what you said about the, it's when it, when you realize it's not about you, when I started the show, it wasn't about me. When I started talking and, and sharing things that were working for me, I did want to share what was working for me to help others, but the people that I had attracted that I was working with in my life at the time were not interested in some of the things that were working for me. So I put it out into the world to see if anyone else wanted to know, but it came from a very genuine, authentic place. Hey, this stuff works. And if you use it, it'll probably work for you too, if you're interested. And so I love what you said about, it's not about you. What I tell a lot of podcasters and speakers when I do media training for my masterminds, because just like you said, everybody gets into that. Oh my God, what do I? look like? How am I presenting myself? Am I going to say the wrong thing? It's all me, 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 me. And so I'm like, okay, behind the microphone, behind the camera, picture somebody that you want to help someone that you that may not want to receive your help that you've tried to help in the past and talked specifically to that person when you're recording your podcast or when you're doing a video or whatever. Uh, I'll have shows where I will literally be talking to a specific person and I'll have 10 people say, oh, you were talking just to me. And I'll, I'll say, well, I wasn't specifically talking to you, but, um, but, but because it resonates at such that level, right? I think that that is where the sales conversation starts to shift. And in podcasting, especially with the relationship building, that is for me, I mean, if you take me through a sales process of closing a sale from someone I've just met one time who knows nothing about me and I know nothing about them, and then I'm supposed to have a relationship in an hour to sell them some big thing, the pressure's on. But if you, but in podcasting, that's been the beauty of this whole thing is the intimacy of this conversation, of the sharing, of the showing up, uh, what you'll call in God's love, I'll call in alignment and from creator or source. So it's like, if you just put it out there with the strongest intention of love and, and of, of being of service, you can't not get back. It is like the highest frequency from anyone to receive and you can't not get back. It's what you do with it next. So, so where are you now? I, so I, I apologize. I didn't know you had a podcast uh, because I thought maybe you and Doug had talked about podcasting um, off uh, on the last conversation that you had. So please tell everybody who's listening about your podcast so that anyone who's listening to this podcast can come listen to your podcast. You bet. It's called The Ziggler Show and Kevin Miller is our host. Uh, we do two episodes a week. We do uh, one with a, with a guest uh, expert or guru and uh, Kevin does that. And then Kevin and I, get together excuse me we get together once a week and we do q a right we just answer all the questions that we get from our from our audience and it's just been it's it's been an amazing thing but jj you, you just hit on something that's um you i think you said the word transparency or vulnerability uh in the sales process and really it's in the relationship process uh, I've, I've invested the last year researching a new book on, uh, it, it's called uh, the 10, or it's on disruption. And this last year of disruption, if you think that's big, you should wait for the next five years. It's, it's going to be unbelievable, the disruption that's coming. But here you hit on the key with, with uh, remote teams and hybrid teams and, and, and you're selling using uh, technology and cameras and you're building relationships with people in a distance and there's asynchronous learning, which means that people are working on projects uh, in different time zones. And they're, the only thing that allows those teams to be creative, collaborative, innovative to, to solve problems, it really comes down to a leader who creates a space for vulnerability. Because if you and I are having a relationship face-to-face and and on a team in the same room and you don't understand something, you're just gonna say, hey, I don't understand it. But if you're in a different city in a different time zone, it's gonna be hard for you to write that into a document that everybody can see 
unless you're either supremely confident or you know it's a safe space. Mm -hmm. And so vulnerability is key. And we, our best customers of all are the ones who appreciate the vulnerability. When we say, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Let me go figure that out. Or I don't understand what you're saying. Tell me more. Uh, I love, you know, and, and when you're willing to admit you don't know something, when you're willing to, to do the extra research and go that extra mile, that's when everything changes. And then you add to the fact that, and if, by the way, if you're in sales, it's the greatest time in the world to be in sales because you do not have to be geographically tied to any <laughs> spot on earth now. You can... The, the number one thing that the companies are going to go after is top performers. And you can work for any company from anywhere in the world. And it's, it's a powerful thing. And just know that it's, it's going to spring from your core values, the principles, the virtues that you live by, and your ability to be transparent and vulnerable that allows other people to give their best work, knowing that whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. It's about growth. It's about going to that next level. I'm curious, why, why do you think that is so? I mean, I can say, hey, I think it's because people like the human element. They like the fact that you don't know everything and the fact that they, they like that. They like that they're connecting with somebody that's more relatable and does not have the answers to every question. But at the same time, you can provide the confidence of being able to deliver your product or service um, without having all of those answers in place. So why do you think that that's so though, Tom? Well, we're seeing it. We're seeing a huge shift and the hockey stick has been slowly, you know, the curve has been slowly getting steeper and steeper. We know millennials don't like to be told what to do. I mean, we, we just, we know that, but do top perform. If you had a top performer on your team, do you think they would say, tell me what to do? Or do you think they would, they would prefer you to ask them what to do? <laughs> They want to be asked what to do. They, they don't want, want to be told. Be <laughs> All right. And, and so what's happening is the top-down authoritative, do it because I said so, command and control leader who is results-driven, they're on the way out. And they cannot win in a relationship that has technology in the middle of it. Because the body language, the idiosyncrasies that we all make up for each other as humans, it gets lost in translation. So who's winning? It's, it's the coach leader. It's, it's somebody who thrives on great questions. It's somebody who knows their people so well that they know what their, what their dreams and hopes are. If I can get alignment, if somebody, if somebody comes to work for my company because of the mission of the company, right? They, they buy into that. And then I know what their personal goal or dream is. And I can help them achieve that. They're going to work for a dream instead of a paycheck. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, because here's what I've noticed that the better you do on the job, usually you get rewarded for it, right? You either make more commission or more salary or more promotions, or you get picked off by the competition. I mean, those are the, those are the things that happen. Well, dreams take time and money. So the better I do, the faster I get my dream. And so the shift is happening to growth. And so the great leaders of the day, they're not focused only on a result because if, if the market changes like a pandemic hits and we have the old plan and we're results oriented only, then we're going to tweak the old plan, which no longer works. If we're growth oriented, we go, oh my goodness, look at this opportunity. It's everywhere. Let's get our team together. Everybody give me your ideas. And because it's a safe place where people can be vulnerable, you can make progress when the old style does it. So I think we're in a rapid uh, time of growth right now. That's why I think disruption is going to be far more in the next five years than it was in the last year. When it comes to millennials, I do love that point that you made because um, about five, six years ago, I was still working one-on-one -on -one with a client who was involved in a massive um investment firm. And, and one of the investments they were making was in some kind of startup, either food or, and they were doing all the market research on the different demographics that they would be marketing to. And the differences between the different age ranges and generations. And one of the things that, so the words that came up for the millennials was that they, 
and, and I see the, the psychological patterning as well of why this has happened. Right. So with my parents or my parents, parents, like how that, how that came to be when you have two parents working full time to try to make money who aren't happy because they're never home. They're never with family. They're always stressed out. And all of a sudden the kids just want nothing more than quality time. And they don't care. They own a house. They don't see this American dream the same way anymore. They see themselves as being uh, simple and movable and transformable and flexible and and I think it's a great goal because it, it has a, a depth of meaning to it about that vulnerability that you talked about, the vulnerability of being human and the need and desire that we all have for connection and to connect with people. I know for me, one of the things on my show, which when we teach podcasters, one of the things that we talk about, at least I talk about anyway, is, is about that not being a host. It's funny when I'll get, oh, the host. I'm like, no, I'm not a host. <laughs> this is my show. And I only bring to you things I care about, not to mention, I also teach what I know in different areas. And I've literally gone through a divorce. I've gone through a move. I've gone through deaths of cats. I've gone through growing in my business. And I share that all on the show because I think, as you were mentioning about leaders and, and communities that, that thrive on the relationship of being vulnerable and transparent. Anyone who's showing you otherwise isn't being honest because who on this path isn't constantly being being challenged or given an opportunity to grow in some way, right? From the what's going on in the world to what's going on in business, with what changes with technology, with what changes with information. So I love that uh, leadership and vulnerability conversation because I think that's one we haven't really talked about on the show. And I think it's an important one because in my opinion, if you want to be a successful podcaster, or a successful salesperson with a community of any kind, whether it be social media, t- Twitter, whatever, wherever, whatever you do, there has to be a, a relationship built. And that relationship has to be built on reality, authenticity, uh, like, you, like you said, vulnerability and transparency. Otherwise we lack trust because there's always somebody who has a shiny, bright new thing that looks like they're all perfectly positioned in every single way. But Most people have a BS meter that know that eventually that's not really true. So I love the vulnerability. That's definitely a needed conversation on this show for anyone who wants to be a leader and who wants to take that community and really serve people, be who you are, be and and embrace who you are. So with that, I just want to ask if there is anything, and you have already said it, but I just want to know if there's anything more. Uh, the difference between you and your dad, right? So you were saying you're kind of more of like the the nerdy guy. And he was, he was, I don't know if, he, if you think he was so much more out there than you are, meaning like personable or um, like running around on stage, right? And maybe you're not. What other attributes of yourself have you come to love or acknowledge or utilize now as a strength and as a zone of genius about who you are now taking this company and moving it forward? So I'm I'm a why behind the why behind the why. <laughs> you know, it's it's like in sales, you know, we, we had a, we were years ago, we were doing a big sales training proposal. The VP of sales were there. It was a, a six figure deal. And uh, we said, you know, if we go forward with this, why do you want to do this? And he said, well, I know what the investment is and I would hope that our sales would increase by 10 percent. And that's why we want to do the training program. I said, well, that's reasonable why? And he said, well, because if, if our sales increase 10%, well, I'll hit our quota, I'll make a nice bonus and we'll make more money. And I said, well, why is that important? He says, well, then we'll have a chance to do it again next year. And if we can build on this, then we'll get more bonuses, make more money. And I said, that's fantastic. Why? And he said, well, then I can pay off the house. <laughs> that go, was the reason right there. <laughs> and I go, why? And he goes, well, then I can buy the lake house. And I go, why? And then his whole demeanor changed. And this is, the, this, this is what you're getting to. He says, well, then my grandkids will come and play at the lake house. And so now we were on a mission for him to play with his grandkids. And that's a totally different uh, deal. And so I'm like that in everything. Like, why does mindset matter? You know, why do we say this instead of that? And, you know, <laughs> is there a sequence to success? I mean, I, I write things with the intentionality, you know, well, what comes first? You, you know, I look around and to me, it, it all starts with the mental. If, if our thinking's not right, if our input's not right, nothing else matters. It's, 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 it's the most important thing that we can do is, is control our thoughts. And, and so what happens, I'll, get, I'll, I'll share with you what happens when your mindset's wrong. We saw it happen in the pandemic. Millions of people went home, everything shut down. 
And they suddenly noticed the stainless steel handcuffs that were on their hands that they'd put there themselves. You see through momentum and hey, you should do this and what about that? People had gotten into careers and businesses and things that they weren't passionate about, but the momentum was there. It paid the bills. They still had an empty spot, but you know the, the, the ability to do this pretty good covered that up. And now they're at home and people they love and care about are dying and people are getting sick and people are losing jobs and their friends are telling them their stories. And they're like, wait a second, there's gotta be more to life than this. But our culture says, hey, you know what? Don't worry, be happy. Go, happiness is what it's all about. Whatever your truth is, as long as it makes you happy, go and do it. And so everybody medicated. They started eating cheesecake and, <laughs> and alcohol and, you know, and drugs and binge on Netflix, right? I mean, that's how we got happy. And they did the death spiral. And that's not where happiness comes from. Uh, I quoted him earlier, but Rabbi Lappin says that the opposite of depression is not happiness. The opposite of depression is purpose. And so the reason I get fired up is we help people discover their purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what's cool. The byproduct of pursuing your purpose is happiness. And that is a powerful thing. And so, you know, I, I, so how am I different than dad besides being the nerd, the why behind the why? He was very charismatic on stage. I mean, he could light up the room and but he was also an introvert and people are like, really? I'm like, yeah, he was really quiet at home. But I like to, I really like to know the why behind the why. The other thing that's, that's kind of a difference is, is dad's message was for everyone. You could literally hear him, get inspired, do something different, get a different result and get hooked. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just, he could condense what what would take others months to get across into a 90 minute presentation and lives would be changed. I'm more about legacy. So when I work with people and what we do now is we equip them to go out and, and, and share our message, right? We, we, we work with coaches and give them coaching programs they can coach and speakers and trainers. And so what gets me excited is when somebody calls me and they say, hey, I was working with somebody and then they took what I taught them and then they taught that to somebody else and that somebody else got a result. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what it's about. It's about the legacy. So, you know, that's how we're different. I, I don't know if I could in one conversation with somebody convince them, but what I'm hoping is that over a lot of conversations, they would go share that with somebody else and that somebody else's life would change. Great words, great words. And, and I know that there's somewhere along the way there was probably in in what everyone what the world is going through right now there's got to be some hidden gift in this you know somewhere along the way i like like look at the silver lining and trying to and trying to find it if you had to pick a hidden gift that is is coming from all of this that is going on in the world right now what would you what would you say that it would be tom well i'll i'll, I'll tell too one of them's kind of funny 60 million hours that's how much we're saving by not getting in the car and commuting every single day i mean what's the can you put a price on time? You can't. I mean, nope. people have people have figured out just because we always did it that way doesn't mean it has to be done that way, right? So I think there's an understanding. And then this other one, I'll share a quote with you that dad had in the 70s and 80s. He said this, he said, he said, if, if standard of living is your goal, quality of life almost never improves. But if quality of life is your goal, standard of living almost always goes up. Mm -hmm. The number awesome. one issue, the number one issue that HR and C-suites and the big companies have lasered in on since the pandemic is the health and well-being of their people. And the top five is work-life balance. So what big companies, right? The academic elite, you know, the eggheads, the people who know better than the rest of us, for the first time, they understand that quality of life equals quality of work. Before it was lip service. It was like, you know, you give me your 70 hours and you figure that other stuff out on your own. Yeah. And now the tables have turned. Wait a second. We better be buying ergonomic chairs for their home office. Mm -hmm. We better be, we better be doing all this stuff. So what does that mean to me? 
if you recognize that quality of life is essential to quality of work, quality of life, we teach that has seven areas, mental, spiritual, physical, family, financial, personal, and career. So that means corporate leaders have to recognize that people are spiritual. And that's been a taboo word inside corporate offices. And believe me, that's on the heart and soul of every person out there right now is, does my life have meaning? Is what I'm doing bringing purpose to what I'm about? And guess what? You can do that working for, you know, <laughs> Walmart, corporate or Google or anybody. You can, you can find meaning in any of those places, which is awesome. But you've got to understand that until you find the meaning in it, your work's never going to be as fulfilling as it could. Amen to that. Totally, totally. JJ, any any final questions before we wrap up? I, I know that I promised Tom we'd keep him about 40 minutes. We're a few minutes over that right now, but uh, anything else that you want to uh, to get from his experience? You, you have a, you have the legacy builder in your hands right now. I'm just I'm just glad I found time and Tom after literally, you know, 45 years of searching, he's been there the whole time. <laughs> I don't know why it took so long. I think just, you know, I, I'm feeling into that people are listening to this and that they're inspired if they don't know what their purpose is or if they're not living a quality life or if they're chasing money or if they're not feeling comfortable in sales of having a new relationship and a, and a view and a perspective on some of this. And so I guess if there was a place uh, besides the podcast to send them because podcasters, people listen to podcasts, listen to podcasts, uh, if there was another place to send them. Uh, where would that be the most like, is it just the website? Yeah. Ziggler.com. Uh, we've got some free gifts. You can download some Zig if you've never heard, uh, which is awesome. The treat. The, the Ziggler show. Uh, if you want a little bit more, but also I'm kind of weird. I, I give out my email address, so Tom at Ziggler.com. So we make it really hard. I, I haven't figured out a, a better way to build a relationship than just saying, Hey, to somebody. So yeah, and Tom, you were very you were very open and warm um, to uh, to share not only your message and your inspiration on the show today, but I, I just you know when I reached out to you, it was a very quick turn from the time that I actually reached out to you that you, re that you returned it, and I've gotten some some really great words from from those that are outside of the Ziegler organization that have said, oh, you are going to really enjoy having Tom. You did not disappoint. You you are you're a great guest to have on the show, and. I'm looking forward to, to many years of great relationship building uh, going forward, Tom. Thank you so much for having me on. What a blessing. Thank JJ, you, wrap it up for us, if you would. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate all of the words of wisdom and your vulnerability and your authenticity and uh, your passion for helping others. So thank you so much for being on the show today and inspiring everyone who's listening along with us. All so right. Much. We'll see you guys all again uh, next week on next week's show. Thanks for being here one more time.